there's this amazing observation by Everett in the 1950s that maybe um, the measurement problem was ill-posed from the word go. That, uh, uh, that as a matter of fact, if you imagine, if you, that, that is, the measurement problem is the business of observing that if the, if the linear um, standard dynamical quantum mechanical equations of motion are true of everything, then unambiguously what those equations commit us to is the claim that at the end of a measurement of, say, the x-spin of a z-spin eigenstate, um, we're in a, a superposition, an entangled superposition of one state in which we see x-spin up and the x-spin is up, and another state in which we see x-spin down and the x-spin is down. And the problem is supposed to be that whatever the hell it would be like to be in a state like that, that is manifestly not the state we're in at the end of one of these measurement processes because that's a state which, among other things, according to the standard interpretation of quantum mechanics, in which there fails to be any determinate matter of fact <coughs> about whether I see up or I see down, and it's supposed to be one of the most direct and um, indubitable introspective experiences we have. So very crudely, there's this beautiful observation of Everett's which one can't help but be deeply intrigued by, um, to the effect that um, it isn't so obvious on reflection that this isn't the state we're in um, at the end of one of these measurement processes. That, for example, if you were to imagine an interview with somebody in an entangled superposition like that, if you were to ask them, tell me, is it the case or is it not the case that you have some definite impression about what the spin is? Well, it follows by linearity and from the fact that if he believed spin is up, he would say, yes, I have a definite impression. And if he believed that spin was down, he would say, yes, I have a definite impression. That it's also the case that in that entangled superposition, he will say with probability one, yes, I have a definite impression about what the spin is. The moment this is noticed, um, um, it suddenly becomes a possibility that the measurement problem was ill-posed in the first place, that on closer examination there wasn't a problem there at all, that all of the, uh, of the attempts for solving this problem that involved, from the point of view of mathematical elegance, such apparently grotesque mutilation of the mathematical formalism of quantum mechanics by inserting nonlinear stochastic processes or by, or by breaking the symmetry between position and momentum by inserting uh, a collapse of one kind or another, uh, or a hidden variable um, of one kind or another, that all this might be unnecessary. These maneuvers to solve the measurement problem are maneuvers that, as a matter of historical fact, physicists have been profoundly unsympathetic to. Um, it looks to them grotesquely ad hoc, grotesquely disrespectful of the elegant mathematical structure um, of the theory, um, not things that could be taken seriously, not things that are sufficiently continuous with the scientific tradition, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and it's very exciting in this context to think that this whole exercise might have been unnecessary from the word go. Moreover, just one more minute. Um, moreover, um, um, this is the only response to the measurement problem that anybody has ever heard of that's local, okay? Um, um, that avoids the, the Bell inequalities um, because Bell was, of course, assuming um, and this is such an innocent sounding assumption that there hardly seems any need to, measure, to mention it, that there are determinate facts of the matter about how the experiments in the left wing and the right wing in a, of an EPR uh, sort of situation come out. Um, um, there, you know, no such assumption is applicable in the context of many worlds. It's indeed a dynamically local theory. There's no Bell-type inequalities. There is non-separability. 
Um, that, that's very different from there being a dynamical non-locality, which there emphatically isn't. Um, the, the allure of such a theory is obvious and profound and eminently defensible. Bravo. So, David Wallace, we've just heard here how your staunch support of things like wave function collapse are really a grotesque <laughs> mutilation of the beautiful theory. What do you have to say to your defense? <laughs> okay, so, um, I mean, I'll get into the spirit of this by uh, speaking the first person about it, but I'll try, like David, to, to you know, make, make a, a good faith attempt to be serious about what I think the problems here are. Okay, so I think we should grant to the defender of the Edward interpretation that it's been a very interesting, it's, it's, it's been a wild ride, lots of interesting stuff's come out of it. Um, and I think we should also kind of recognise as a straw man objection by the Everettians that, that our main problem with this is it's kind of wildness or ontological extravagance. I think that's the popular problem with it. But I think anyone who's studied the Everett interpretation still doesn't, and still doesn't like it is going to be somebody who's used to the weirdness of physics, who's willing to grant weirdness if the price is right. Unfortunately, I think the price is not right in this case. I think there's two different, different sorts of ways you might worry about Everett. Um, so <coughs> philosophers, I think, tend to be worried about the interpretation in its own terms. In one sense or another, it doesn't make sense. Um, and so the philosopher needs the Everett interpretation to succeed in demonstrating something coherent and successful. The physicist, I think, well, shares those, those concerns, but is also often concerned about, you know, something somewhat more pragmatic. How does this help us? How does this advance physics? And for that, the, the advocate of the Everett interpretation has to say why it's somehow going to move forward the state of physics to help the development of quantum theory. And unfortunately, I think the Everett interpretation fails on both counts. Now, I think the reasons are multifaceted, so I'll just pick on the main themes in each case. I think that the, the, the thing which, which is just ultimately has to be acknowledged as an Achilles heel for the Everett interpretation is and has always been the problem of probability. And yeah. there's a certain amount of double... You know, to, 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 to borrow a version of Tim Maudlin for this, you know, I have Schrodinger's cat experiment number one, where the amplitude, where the mod squared amplitude of the cat being alive is half. Everett take on this, there's branches. Here's a branch with a live cat, here's a branch with a dead cat. I have quantum mechanics uh, with Schrodinger's cat experiment, where the mod squared amplitude of one of the branches is 0.99. I've got a branch with a live cat, I've got a branch with a dead cat. It's obscure, to say the least, about... What as, as to why the 0.99 has got anything to do with the observed frequencies, given that both outcomes occur, given that the cat is alive in one branch and dead in the other branch. And I think it's important to keep our feet on the ground here, because one of the things you tend to hear from defenders of the theory is, is a kind of something that, in, if, if you're not careful, can slip into a mysterianism about probability, a concern that probability is a mystery right across the board. And as, as, as I say, we, we, we need to keep our feet on the ground. We need to recognise that, at least in physics, um, our de facto link between probability and the world has never been particularly in doubt. Probability in physics has always been about long-run frequencies. In the kind of, we, we know how to test physical theories. We know deterministically how to test them. When the theory says uh, the probability of such and such outcome is you know, 0.4, let's say, we know what that says. But if I run the experiment thousands and thousands of times and I don't get a result in the vicinity of 0.4 times thousands and thousands of times, the theory is out of the water. Um, there's, there's, room, there's fuzz around the edges there, but basically that's how it works. And that fundamental link between probability and frequency, however obscure the details might be, does seem to be completely central to the way we, as physicists, think about probability. And that seems to be something that the Everett interpretation is simply unable to recover. Now to, now to go to the more pragmatic side of the concerns. Um, it is, in a sense, what David said as an advantage can be seen as a disadvantage. Um, quantum mechanics is the most profound change in our picture of reality that we've basically ever had. Um, one way or another, it's, it seems that the measurement problem of quantum mechanics, therefore, is a route by which we can make some kind of extraordinary progress. Maybe the way to make progress is to change the physics. And in that case, maybe the measurement problem points us to ways in which we can change the physics, which gives us a kind of end run around the incredible difficulties of testing quantum mechanics difficult, um, you know, limitations in other regimes. Or alternately, maybe, um, and this is something perhaps philosophers should take more seriously, um, Quantum th physics is an illustration to us that our kind of what seems to us to be an a priori right way of thinking about metaphysics, a kind of you know independent third person realism about the world, is actually itself just one more classical limiting case, and that somehow what quantum mechanics is telling us is that there's a way to think about the world which just didn't look anything like the kind of stuff that we came up, we came up with in our pre quantum mechanical thinking. I mean to conclude, every problem is an opportunity. The measurement problem is a lever which we can work to gain deep insight either into the 
physical nature of the world or into the metaphysical nature of the world. The Edward interpretation sands off that lever. So, you know, um, uh, it, it basically tells us to move on. And th it, that, that kind of superficial advantage, I think, genuinely has a, a high cost, which advocates of the Edward interpretation don't necessarily answer successfully. Amen.